<clears throat> wow, what a, um, what a rare opportunity and what a, a, a great gift and honor. Uh, thanks, Don. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, Leslie. Um, thanks, Josh, for all your support and having me here. It's, um, it, it, I want to brag a little on Don uh, for just a moment. Um, he was part of a rare cohort when I got to Emporia State um, that made uh, a real rookie into a good teacher, uh, a decent teacher, because uh, it was hard to mess that up. They were that good, they were that dedicated, and um, every scholar should have at least one of those moments in their career where they've got this cohort uh, who are hungry and smart and eager and, um, and make you better. And I, and I had that, and I wanna thank you for that, uh, because that was a great way to start a career. I've had a couple of moments like that since in other places, but uh, I think uh, often back to that group of, of, of students and how they helped me in many ways to start on a, a path, a journey. I didn't really know where it, would, where it was going. So thank you for that. Um, what I'd like to do tonight is to um, complicate, I think, our understandings of the Civil War in a place that when I first started working on uh, the borderland, so to speak, between North and South really didn't figure into an awful lot of Civil War scholarship. Um, it was kind of ignored. I felt like a little bit that I was um, howling in the wilderness. Uh, uh, but it's not that way any longer. Um, the borderland has become central to our understanding of the experience of the Civil War, and it's also central in many ways to the, uh, to the changing interpretations of that war that we've undergone in the last few years. And I'm, um, I'm very grateful for the response I've had to the book after that many years of working on it. It's nice to have uh, folks who appreciate and understand uh, the importance of what you've been doing for a very long time. And um, also the complications within that, the, uh, the uh, incongruities that occur uh, occurred in this place that um, don't have easy answers, but they uh, form an important um, component in how we are now understanding that conflict that really was not resolved in the way that we would have expected and that in many ways continues to haunt us uh, even as recently in the as the last few years and why it's haunting us in the lack of uh, resolution. And that's that word irreconciliation is one I actually use in the book to help us to understand that. Um, I'm assuming this is my advancer, right? Yep, good. All right, so um, let me get started. As if 1866, the first year after the reputed end of the Civil War, had not been bad enough, uh, there came the latest dispatch from the Reverend Petroleum V. Nasby. Nasby was a semi-literate inebriate, a one-time secessionist, and a committed anti-war copperhead. And he hailed from the rural Northwest Ohio hamlet of Wingert's Corners, comprised mostly, according to Nasby, of white, quote, truly democratic residents who, claiming America for white men, seceded immediately from their free state. And then they resolved against black immigration and passed an ordinance authorizing slavery in Northwest Ohio. This is what they wanted, according to Nasby. They wanted the garment revolutionized to keep New England, which is spreading itself all over the West, from submerging the entire Democratic Party. Our bark was on the sea, slavery was its anchor, its jib boom, its right forward mast, its bowsprit, its keel, its all. Is it, can everybody hear me all right? Okay, okay, good. Rather than be drafted, Nas Nasby enlisted and then he promptly deserted the Confederate Army and he returned to Ohio to found what he called the Church of St. Valendigam. And then he quit, and of course that was the, the great dissenter of the Civil War, Clement Valendigam. Then he quit the state altogether after Abraham Lincoln's and the Ohio Republicans' overwhelming 1864 election victory. After wandering several border states with divided allegiances, he settled in Kentucky in a place he called Confederate Crossroads, and they spelled it with an X, which of course is a mark of illiteracy. 
and he described this village Riley as, quote, the typical village in the unreconstructed South. Kentucky didn't secede, and therefore within her borders, secessionists is safe. Thank the Lord for Kentucky. Well, if you haven't figured it out already, Nasby was a fictional character out of the fertile imagination of a newspaperman, David Ross Locke. Locke was a native New Yorker who moved west in 1861, and he began publishing his column in Finley, Ohio, not surprisingly, in Northwest Ohio. Nasby's letters became a wartime sensation, and he gleefully skewered pro-Confederate and also pro-slavery sentiment in his adopted state of Ohio. Carried in serial form, it became a Western Republican staple. When introduced to the column in 1864, Lincoln reputedly claimed that had he the author's genius, he'd swap places for the good of the country. And he personally thanked Locke for having, in his words, stirred people to right thinking and decisive action. What that meant was solidifying wartime Republican support and loyalism. In October 1865, after the war ended, Locke would move to Toledo and he would write for the rest of his life for the Blade. From 1866 to 1872, Locke's Nasby's letters, as they were known, did as little to harmonize the West's battered landscape as the war itself had. His columns and the book's principal foil was the nightmarish racial and political violence that was unfolding across the Ohio and Mississippi rivers in Kentucky and Missouri, worse even then than in the former Confederacy. These loyal slave states, exempted largely from Reconstruction measures, as Nap Nasby mentioned, and therefore I, for free to, to defy them, were perfect representations of the violent politics of Southernization in these states. But Nasby's satirical target was the politics of white supremacy that rent his adopted state, Ohio, before, during, and after the Civil War. Indeed, Nasby's villagers sent, in one of his writings, quote, a greeting to their brethren of Ohio with thanks for their prompt and effectual squelching of the idea of Negro superiority. What he meant, of course, was the angry post-war racial climate and politics in Ohio that would result in the state's rescission of its initial ratification of the 14th Amendment and the full rejection of, its, of the 15th Amendment, which gave citizenship rights, including voting, to African Americans. Locke did far more than satirize, simply satirize, former, former rebel Kentuckians and Ohio war dissenters, or copperheads as they were known, in the war and the post-war years. He established for his largely Republican readership the individualist contours of white southerness. And what that meant, according to him, was, and for Republicans who read him, racial bigotry, unrestrained violence, democratic affiliation, stultifying lack of education, and blind Confederate identity and loyalty. By creating a negative reference affiliation, or a reference point, in Western states that um, George William Curtis, the editor of Harper's Weekly, lampooned for its Democrats as rough scuff my policy, and its insistence that government was created by, of, and exclusively for white men, Locke confirmed for his readers the collectivist contours of northernness principled restraint from violence, abiding respect for the education and the law, support for the modern order, and above all else, the emancipation of slaves and the advocacy of the Republican Party. So they defined what it meant to be Northern and Southern out of this war experience and out of the politics that surrounded it, more than they were born into uh, these sorts of identities. For us, most of us hold uh, that the Ohio River is a clearly defined and a static demographic and political boundary between North and South that by distinctive cultures was, and histories was an extension of the Mason-Dixon line, the fixed boundary between freedom and slavery. School children learned this scripture written as a binary that the South lost to the North. 
And in prevailing narratives, the Civil War rarely serves as a defining event in the history of a third region, the West, and vice versa. Yet this former West was central to perhaps the Civil War's most lasting outcome, the cultural politics of what I call irreconciliation, especially in these Western states or former Western states, that would fashion discrete and often inaccurate memories of the winning and the losing of that war, and that would establish the middle border as a front for a far longer war after the war, fought for nearly half a century with internecine and violence and politics, formal and informal. The Civil War changed the meaning of this border. In fact, it created it, and with it the nation's regions as we understand them today. Unable to conform either to the emergent southern or northern war narratives after the war, the battleground that was the West, the former West anyway, was effectively written out of the war. And by 1926, residents had created an entirely new regional geography driven by these cultural identities. Northern, Southern, and more complicatedly, Midwestern. And I'll try to tackle some of that, and maybe all of it, in this talk. Now, I'm not going to talk about the war. I'm going to talk about a different landscape, a landscape that the war made rather than the other way around. In March 1865, a federal commander in central Missouri's western or slaveholding locus along its Missouri River central counties wrote this, slavery dies hard. I hear its expiring agonies and witness its contortions in death in every quarter of my district. Accomplished by different mechanisms, slavery's death in both Missouri and Kentucky triggered years of post-war violence and decades of war-driven politics. A four-way struggle raged, raged between occupying Union forces, freed people who tried to exercise their rights of freedom, white Unionists, former Confederates, or their supporters, many of them disfranchised who warred to limit those freed people's rights. Guerrilla violence was debilitating, and much of it was based on anti-emancipation, pro-slavery um, ideologies, far more than pro-Confederate ideologies. It was debilitating during the war, particularly in Missouri. We know, some of us know that story. Also in Western Kentucky, we don't know that story quite as well. And it now became endemic in both states. Unionists in many communities called for troops to protect themselves and support civil governments, while others begged to have federal troops removed, especially if they were black, something that would occur in Kentucky in the fall of 1865 and in Missouri the following spring, well ahead of former Confederate states. Chafing under their defeat as one groused, Former Confederate guerrillas and paroled Confederates waged overt partisan and racial warfare throughout the former slaveholding areas of Kentucky and Missouri, and they were scattered around the states where it was really dense. In some towns, ex-Confederates still in uniform murdered freed people and unionists and warned others to leave or die. Others proclaimed their gangs of night riders to be regulators or Negro regulators or simply Ku Klux. All of this was happening in 1865 and 66, well ahead of schedule as far as the rest of the South. And they fired into private res residences and they taunted Unionists. This is a quote. Some of those men say they intend to kill the last Negro soldier that comes to this county. All, and this was from Western Kentucky, all of this class of men are returned rebel soldiers. Violence in the search for freedom drove African Americans by the thousands to cities like St. Louis and Cincinnati and Lexington and Louisville, where many organized with veterans to exercise or protect their fragile freedom rights. Black Missouri veterans, as you see here, founded the Lincoln Institute in Jefferson City, while former Confederate or Kentucky soldiers, Union soldiers, African Americans, were instrumental in helping to form or reform Berea College as a biracial institution, much like Ohio's Oberlin College. White solidarity took the form of appeals to join what was called the rebel democracy, the pejorative term that 
loyal unionists used for conservatives, as they called themselves, or anti-emancipation, anti-civil rights opponents. In Missouri, radical unionists swept into power in 1864, securing control of the legislature, enacting a state emancipation ordinance before the war's end, and passing a new constitution that disfranchised former Confederates and sympathizers who were known, again, pejoratively as stay-at-home rebels. Racialized politics quickly built steam. The summer of 1866 saw the first issue of Lexington, Missouri's weekly Caucasian, and it became a leading national voice in the resistance against Reconstruction, the Reconstruction Acts, by tying the struggle of local white conservatives, and they called themselves that, to the Ku Klux, Ku Klux groups in Kentucky and also in the former Confederate states. These advertisements, the editor ran openly. Similar white supremacist tropes called to angry Western Missourians in the pages of St. Joseph's Missouri Vindicator. And this is a quote from the very first issue. We are Caucasian in blood, in birth, and in prejudice. In Osage County, Missouri, wartime unionist Lebius Zevely, I think that's how to pronounce it, refused to sign the loyalty oath required by the new state constitution and founded what he called the Unterrified Democrat, among the longest running newspapers currently still published in the state of Missouri under the same title. And it is a hoot to read, <laughs> let me just say. Those uh, Democrats have been a little more terrified until late, so um, um, we'll see what happens in, in a couple months. In Kentucky, the ratification of the 13th Amendment, which ended slavery, hung in the balance until the fall 1865 elections. With 65,000 to 75,000 slaves still held in legal limbo, many white Kentuckians, in one words, one's words, enforced their ideas of Kentucky law by refusing to release their slaves until and even after the 13th Amendment became national law. And they employed all means of, of, of obstruction to prevent them from gaining that freedom. And this is a quote from a Bowling Green, Kentucky resident. Take these bayonets out of the state and we'll show you whether slavery is dead or not. In Grayson County, Kentucky, just weeks before the election, David Clever Phillips witnessed the political assassination of a pro-amendment candidate whose son served in the federal ranks after a speech in favor of the 13th Amendment. And Phillips wrote this, it won't do to run men who has occupied his position at this crisis to command the union vote, not just the abolitionist vote. Old Grayson's right on this question. I found that letter in the middle of my research and realized very quickly that was my Kentucky ancestor. So I knew how he stood on the end of that war. And it was a bit of a shock, partly because he was so open about it. On election day, many garrison commanders refused to prevent disloyalists former Confederates and even known guerrillas from voting, and election judges certified the votes in districts where secession flags hung inside of polling places. Defiantly rejecting federal authority and with few troops occupying the state to protest the national ratification of the 13th Amendment in its December 1865, Kentucky's legislature repealed its four-year-old law of expatriation, which, had, which effectively re-enfranchised former Confederates. Militant conf former Confederates swept into office by 1866, replacing the state's former Union conservatives, as they called themselves. Even former emancipationists quickly converted, and former Confederate generals would hold the state's governorship for nearly two consecutive decades. Kentucky would not ratify the 13th Amendment until 1976, 111 years after slavery's de jure end, but that was faster than Mississippi. Communities throughout this region witnessed virtual reenactments of the late war after the shooting supposedly stopped. Lines of self-described Southern men exchanged shots with self-described Union men, often former federal soldiers, while, quote, uncompromising Union men along with black veterans and even peace-seeking former Confederates, found themselves beset by mobs of lynch men and, as one wrote, 
midnight intrusions. No house is safe outside town. At Russellville, Kentucky, Unionists suffered returning Confederates who, quote, in one's words, dress and parade the streets in their Confederate uniforms fully armed with revolvers and constantly fire weapons, especially at night. Even anti-emancipation Unionists who fought back, like, this will kick you in the head, Frankfurt's John Marshall Harlan, who opposed emancipation. Yes, that Mar John Marshall Harlan that will cast the only dissenting vote against Plessy versus Ferguson. He opposed emancipation as well. They were terrorized from their homes, he among them. Vowing, quote, that they had been treated like dogs by the people of Kentucky long enough, many federal soldiers, white and black, struck back, organizing paramilitary union leagues or union regulators. Midnight wars resulted. As one frightened resident wrote, with opposing vigilante forces, often in uniforms, quote, trying all the time to kill each other. They waylay the roads for each other. As one recently returned Indiana soldier claimed, when he got home from being stationed in Kentucky, he said, killing a guerrilla is called murder in the vocabulary of Kentucky copperheadism. The radical union men may as well dig their own graves if they haven't done it already politically. By wide margins, both of these former slave states soon rejected the 14th and 15th Amendments and their national ratifications, especially the 15th, allowing black voting, unleashed racial frenzies in each. To defend white-only government against what one Kentucky resident called the black peril, meaning rumored armed what they called Negro Ku Klux companies, many of them veterans who were intent then on securing African Americans' right to exercise the vote for the first time. From 1870 to 1874, battalions of what were called white citizens' guards. Does that sound familiar? I bet it does. They mustered into the Kentucky National Legion and fought alongside paramilitary Klan groups on election days to prevent blacks from voting. A similar, if delayed, outcome occurred in Missouri, with the rebel democracy at last gaining power there in 1874. Two years later, during the National Centennial, a constitutional convention in Missouri overturned the prescriptive radical 1865 constitution that had disfranchised former Confederates, and they soon, like in Kentucky, swept back into state offices. And they would help to elect two former Confederates to the U.S. Senate, who would then both serve for the next quarter century. And in 1884, a former Confederate general, John Sappington Marmaduke, won the governorship in Missouri. Across the rivers, in the middle borders, free states, familiar yet distinct landscapes of war uh, emerged. Racial animosity and violence were subsumed within war-driven party politics. But these politics manifested themselves at the state level as fierce contests that mirrored their wartime divisions and in turn deepened political animosities that were carried over from the war. Unlike the states across the rivers or below them, this political struggle for home rule soon became known, if with different meanings, as the bloody shirt. At the national level, Republican and Democratic congressmen used war wounds as weapons. But Western Republicans also drew sharp racial limits to the Union triumphant trope, often refusing to embrace even minimal political rights and social privileges for African Americans. As former slaves surged across the rivers to these free states, especially to cities and towns in border counties like Cincinnati, most lower Ohio River counties saw their black populations double and even triple by the end of the 1860s. Racial hostility in these states portended a realignment of their southern counties with former slave state neighbors as the national debates entwined the laden terms Negro question and Southern question. With Cairo, Illinois, once contraband camp, now bursting at the seams with some 3,000 newly arrived freed people, the post commander there wrote in 1865 this, the prevailing sentiment among the white population of the city is disloyalty to the government. 
and extreme hatred of free Negroes. In Cincinnati the following spring, the newspaper Colored Citizen reported attacks on black veterans by recently returned white federal soldiers, all still in uniform, meaning both white and black. Less to promote black equality than to torment Democrats, Illinois and Ohio's Republican-controlled legislatures quickly ratified the 13th Amendment and repealed their state's black laws, save for suffrage prohibitions. By a whisker, Republicans in Indiana's self or, or, or uh, decried Copperhead legislature, meaning Democratic legislature, managed to ratify the 14th Amendment without repealing its black immigration law, making Indiana the nation's last former free state to keep racial exclusion laws on its books. This all happened after the war. The politics of sacrifice of federal veterans in particular, many of them Republicans, led this new political warfare. Commanded by the Union's great triumvirate, Westerners, Ulysses S. Grant, William T. Sherman, Philip Sheridan, and confident that their armies rather than their Eastern counterparts had led the nation to victory by a hardline style of war, many returned home with deep enmity for those who had either not supported or who had outright opposed their cause. This is a quote, men cannot go through a prolonged emotional crisis and not pay the price, admitted one Illinoisan. It makes people hysterical. Although prevented by their officers from exacting full vengeance on Southerners, meaning in the South, <coughs> as newly um, recoined Lincoln's Avengers, they now abused former Copperheads at home, calling them home rebels and eschewing all affectations of reconciliation. Federal officers turned partisan Republicans, like Ro Illinois' Robert G. Ingersoll and Ohio's James A. Garfield. And they told veterans, quote, every scar you have on your heroic bodies was given to you by a Democrat. Federal veterans, particularly those bearing wounds and veterans organizations, men's as well as women's, were universal presences at the party's political rallies, helping Republicans maintain control of state legislatures for as long as a quarter century. Voting like they shot, Federal veterans drew down on anti-emancipation Democrats who had uh, espoused an idea that there was a loyal West, one that was loyal to the Union cause but was not supportive of emancipation. These people denied that slavery had caused the war in protest of radical reconstruction in electoral warfare. And virtually all Republican candidates in these states at local, state, and national levels were themselves federal veterans. Many, usually officers, Democrats were often were un unable to contend, leading one to splutter this, 100 soldiers of the late war have more influence politically in any community than 200 citizens who never robbed hen roosts or masticated hardtack in range of rebel guns. From 1868 to 1900, every Republican presidential candidate but one had a military record. Five of them were Ohioans, the first being Grant, the federal war hero who was elected in 1868 by wide margins in all of these states. As wartime loyalty offered currency for post-war grievances, daily political warfare in local communities saw unionists, men and women, hurl epithetic terms rebel and copperhead at former dissenters to bar them from church membership and communion. And those so inflicted responded in kind with words like radical and Yankee. Local partisanship informed and not quickly manifested into insults, lawsuits, business boycotts, and threats or of or outright violence. Singing Copperhead songs, as one Ohio music instructor learned by anonymous letter, quote, will get your damn nose broke. I'll be at your singing, and if I hear that song, down goes your meat house. I don't know exactly what that meant, but it didn't sound good. A message sent. Many were Democratic veterans who claimed that they too had fought and bled for a just cause, the Union as it was, 
and they returned home unrepentant. Hundreds of men died in post-war feuds that followed war loyalties in service or non-service. Because women actively participated in this partisan uh, personal warfare, they were little, little spared. A, quote, female teacher expressive of the wish that Grant, Sherman, and others would take the cholera and suddenly die was dismissed when she vowed publicly that she would not carry a Union flag to the proposed picnic of the scholars, but that she intended to carry a rebel flag. Imputing disloyalty, Republican newspapers gleefully published the names of local female recipients of wartime dead letters to effectively expose them as disloyal. The 15th Amendment put Republicans in a defensive posture not seen since 1860. Only Illinois, with its Republicans conscious of the martyred president's emancipationist legacy and in control of the legislature, ratified it. In Indiana, a controversial interpretation of the state's constitution quorum requirements allowed a vote with the Democrats absent, resulting in ratification. And you know, full disclosure, the Democrats walked out. So the Republicans voted without them. In Ohio, the amendment met with outright defeat in the majority Democratic legislature. Even self-styled Western radicals opposed it, leading Cincinnati's Gazette, a Republican organ, to conclude this. A legislature could not be chosen in Ohio which would adopt it, meaning the 15th Amendment. The same state that Lincoln reputedly claimed had, in his words, saved the nation after Ohio voters had rejected the Copperhead Clement L. Valendingham for governor in 1863, while he was in exile, by the way, after having been arrested for giving anti-government speeches. Now, it became the first state to reject the 15th Amendment. And by the way, that contributed in many ways to the 1870 Enforcement Acts that were passed by Congress. War-driven politics fueled retributive racial violence in rural areas of the middle border's former free states where racial subordination was tradition, especially during and after the 15th Amendment debates. Just as in 1864, whites in Washington County, Indiana, had violently driven out all black residents of the entire county in wartime in the first incident of what one uh, scholar has called racial cleansing in American history, Regulators, or white caps as they called themselves, increasingly targeted African Americans for rough justice as vestiges of the war's emancipation outcome. In the half century after the war's end, white Indiana vigilantes lynched no less than 20 Af African Americans. Many of these Ku Kluxers, as they called themselves <coughs> proudly, had migrated during or after the war from neighboring slave states. One former Kentucky slave, Nancy East, living in Middletown, Ohio, which is a little north of Cincinnati, remembered this. She said, I never heard nothing about Ku Klux at all until we come up here, and I had them here. She came from Kentucky. Posses and militia on several occasions were called to quell mobbings and often met armed resistance from Democratic war veterans. Their vigilantism now blended with war partisanship. And in an 1872 Ku Klux lynching of two white men jailed for rape near Van Wert, Ohio, and Van Wert is almost to Fort Wayne, Indiana, clear in the northern part of the state, near Nasby's fictionalized Wingert's Corners, not ironically. Members of that mob offered, quote, three cheers for Jeff Davis during the hanging. In the years to come, nearly three decades of what one historian has called commemorative separa um, separatism allowed cultural politics by discrete white southern and northern myth makings to explain the wartime sacrifice of some 750,000 people. And by doing so, they would complete the cultural border that would redefine this former West into something else. Erased from the war memories were dissenters like Clement L. Valendigam, remembered only by Edward Everett Hale's biting anti-dissent short story, Man Without a Country. And the majority populations of white and black unionists in the former slave states were also forgotten. Those who served in the federal ranks or maintained wartime support for the, uh, for the union. Commemorative civic rituals, such as cemeteries and monuments, 
veterans encampments and reunions, as well as organizations, whether union triumphalists or uh, generally Republicans or uh, Confederates and sympathizers of the lost cause. All of these were constructed in this formative period after the war. They were fueled by popular literature in the form of stilted memoirs and county histories and novels created, and they created these mutually exclusive communities and counter narratives in which Ohioan, Ohioans, Indianans, Illinoisans were uniformly loyal and conversely, Kentuckians and Missourians were even more uniformly disloyal. And I put this image up, um, not because it's all that surprising uh, to see a Confederate cemetery, but it is surprising that this is the newly renamed town of Confederate Kentucky, renamed in the 1860s from whatever its name it had been before. And so that is the Confederate Kentucky Cemetery, not just a Confederate cemetery. That's how far some of these places went to uh, adapt and adopt that Confederate uh, identity. In the half century after the war's end, white residents in the West's former borderland created this hard border that was accompanied by discrete inversions of Prussian military theorist Karl von Clausewitz's famous dictum that war is politics by other means. In fact, in these states, politics became other means to achieve thwarted war goals. Despite similarities of racial discourse and ideology that span the rivers, white residents above and below them, um, for white residents above and below them, the war's realities were appropriated to rewrite the war narratives, to conform to the war's national outcomes. Petroleum V. Nasby's genius was manipulating cultural aesthetics to influence formal politics to anti-slavery anti Republicans' advantage. The process was at work in inverse in the former slave states, with pro-slavery Democrats the ultimate victors that, there. Winning these wars took a half a century, but they fully divided these former free and slave states that had once mostly fought on the same side in that long ago war, supposedly for union. Western Kentucky offers the apotheosis of the entwinement of Civil War memory and the new Southern identity. At Fairview, Kentucky, the birth site of Confederate President Jefferson Davis is marked with a concrete obelisk 351 feet high, dedicated on June 7, 1924. An estimated 10,000 people attended that dedication, including former Kentucky Unionists and federal veterans. And they witnessed the dedication of what Robert Penn Warren remembered, he was a resident of that region, as, quote, a faint white finger pointing skyward. You can still see that faint white finger because it's very much there and you can see it for a couple miles away if you go the right direction. Only months earlier, as that finger was nearing completion, the local Ku Klux Klan burned a fiery cross on the spire's yet unpeaked top. Its unmistakable physical and symbolic presence announced and announces that this former contested ground south of the Ohio River had and has been claimed for the Southern Confederacy and for the South. Among the many ironies of the Civil War is both presidents were born about 100 miles apart in Kentucky, a state that never seceded officially, but the Confederates counted them as one of the stars on the flag. More uniquely, the cultural politics that appropriated this national binary spawned an entirely new region, the Midwest. The post-war northernization, as I call it, in places like Cleveland and Milwaukee and Indianapolis and especially Chicago, which benefited from economic nationalism as an engine of victory and transformed the upper portions of these states largely bypassed the rural, former butternut, as they called them, uh, these rural residents who tended to sympathize with the South, portions of these former Union states, meaning the lower portions of the states, and particularly the rural ones. Rather than accept their rural areas as northern, former dissenters in these rural counties waged an intense struggle over nationalism and traditionalism 
in them and in their region. These rural counties became the epicenter for resurgent white supremacy and trumpeted their conservative racial traditions. The second incarnation of the Ku Klux Klan saw its strongest membership and national leadership in this butternut region and in particularly in Indiana, where its national leadership came from. Progressives in small towns in that region, like ed, uh, Kansas editor William Allen White in Emporia, Kansas, where I used to live, coined the term Midwest, specifically attaching tropes of pastoralism and social progress and independence, democratic egalitarianism, civic virtue, all of those things associated with the Midwest generally, specifically to counter the image of regressive violence in these non-urban spaces of the free states, former free states. So rather than denote an absence of region, as commonly argued, the term Midwest reflects a yet unreconciled in intra-regional contest over the meanings and broader outcomes of that distant civil war. The stretching shadows of the former middle border's forgotten civil war have proven persistent and complicated. Exploiting historical events and understandings, sports marketers employ border war imagery to lure collegiate sports fans to athletic contests between state universities in Kansas and Missouri, and also Missouri and Illinois, in which those in Kentucky and now Missouri are eager members of an intercollegiate athletic con uh, conference whose identity rests almost exclusively on these states' former um, affiliation with the long dead Southern Confederacy. Gorillas are included in this imagery. This is an image of the burning of Lawrence, Kansas by William Crontrill. And the term scoreboard says it all, at least for this Mizzou fan. So too in these states, primary and secondary schools boast mascots, or they did, and some of them are getting rid of them now, with war-born cultural names such as rebels and cavaliers and colonels. While above the rivers finds a compliment they find in some schools they're called rail splitters and greenbacks and generals and farmers. At Bardstown, Kentucky, the Federal Hill Mansion, former residents of Pennsylvania-born Judge John Rowan and the centerpiece of the old Kentucky home state historical site is referred to as the inspiration for Stephen Foster, a Cincinnatian or a Pennsylvanian living in Cincinnati, to write his famous plantation song. And this Latter-day Plantation, as it's known today, welcomes visitors to the state's genteel southern past, including generous hospitality and an in invisible narrative of slavery. Ironically, of course, Foster's lyrics, most of which are unsung as Kentucky's official state song now, was adopted in 1875 as such, were inspired by Harriet Beecher Stowe's famous anti-slavery novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was banned in Kentucky in 1908 to be performed as a play. What do the lyrics actually reflect in my own Kentucky home? The lament of a slave sold south to Louisiana. Aversion to culture, uh, southern cultural perceptions influence public representation of the Civil War and of the region north of the rivers. In the 1990s, the board of a north suburban Cincinnati school district created in the 1950s and now fast growing voted to build simultaneously two identical new high schools. It soon faced a naming problem. Although the, track, the land tracks for the schools lay several miles directly north and south of one another, the board chose to name these schools Lakota East and West, largely because parents in the Southern District, whose children would attend that southernmost school, pressured the district's board, not wanting the negative cultural stigma of the designation South. In fact, as what, I, what I found in the records was, we don't want to be the dumb school, is what one parent said. From the 1930s to 2000, billboards in southern Illinois beckoned tourists to the state's infamous Old Slave House, which was the former slaveholder John Crenshaw's home called Hickory Hill. They quickly came down when Illinois' Historic Preservation Agency at last acquired the property that it had long tried to get, promising to restore it as a historical site and absolutely promising, meaning in writing, not to raise it 
the embarrassed state legislature of Illinois closed the house to the public, and it remains closed, as does the most glaring reminder of the state's long forgotten history of slavery in favor of the more appropriate uh, Appalachian land of Lincoln. As travelers whiz through Cincinnati, only the elevated sign announcing the corporate home of the Western and Southern Insurance Company reminds them of the transitory nature and meaning of American regions and the, of the former borderland along the Ohio River. Crossing the river in Lexington, Kentucky until very recently, one could actually see the Confederate statues of John Hunt Morgan and John C. Breckinridge, only steps from the city's infamous former slave market. They have since been removed as they have in other places. Traveling west, crossing the Mississippi River at St. Louis, travelers cannot avoid the massive arch built as the gateway to the west. One that frames the courthouse that you can see in the picture where Dred Scott was denied twice his freedom. And then only miles farther west in Missouri, along I-70, they'll be greeted by signs advertising that they'd enter, they've entered Little Dixie, the moniker for the state's former slaveholding river counties. And, and then, since it's Confederate Renaissance in the 1870s, that would then move to Kansas City, the state's Confederate capital, where you can find Confederate monuments and burial sites in plain view in the uh, largest cemetery in the, in the city. The deep social and political divisions unleashed by the Civil War have cast very long shadows in the form of over a century of extended post-war contests over the meaning and legacies of that conflict. More recently, another legacy of unreconciled outcomes of a long distant war on the reputed border between freedom and slavery have manifested themselves as racial violence. In Cincinnati in 2000 and 2016, in Ferguson and St. Louis, Missouri in 2014, and of course, in Baltimore before that. In 2017, in Charlottesville, Virginia, the normally quiet home of a public university judged among the nation's best, avowed conservatives or white nationalists, including prominent graduates of the University of Virginia, bearing both Confederate and Nazi flags and vowing, quote, to take our country back, tried to hold a Unite the Right rally to protest the city's decision to remove the statue of Robert E. Lee erected in 1924 following the semi-centennial of the Civil War from a park recently renamed Emancipation Park. It used to be called Lee Park. Violence ensued when they were met with sign-carrying counter-protesters and armed National Guard. In perhaps the ordeal's most shocking twist, the perpetrator of the purposeful killing of an unarmed counter-protester was an Ohio resident, recently uh, relocated from northern Kentucky. Recent evidence, evidence suggests that many, if not most, of those white nationalists were in Charlotte, Charlottesville, hail from outside the old Confederacy. Midwestern states like Ohio, as we're reminded painfully, are not immune from the recurrent spates of populism and political and social revolts of white, often rural, small town Americans riven by race and class anxieties that have erupted throughout the Midwest and the South such as in the 1890s and the 1920s, and most recently in the 2000s, following the Great Recession. The current spate of political passion over monuments in the former Confederate states may be more directly related to the 2016 election of John, Donald Trump as the nation's 45th president than that distant war. But fueling the simmering controversy in bypassed or forgotten places like Franklin, Ohio, where there is a Confederate monument, or there was until it was removed, and there was a controversy over it, as you can see here. This is a legacy of dissent over the loss of various forms of societal control long associated with Union victory. The Civil War's continuing influence in the Midwest is a shadowy warfare fought as racialized grievance politics. And you can see a glimpse of this in the electoral maps from 2008, 2012, and 2016, which I'll put up. 
This is a virtual representation with a couple of few exceptions of the, um, of the configuration of states in 1860 and their votes for Lincoln or other candidates. And by 2012, we can see even more retrenchment. And by 2016, only two states of the Midwest voted for Hillary Clinton. Minnesota and predictably Lincoln's Illinois and mine. And we can see how in many ways the West and the South, or should I say the Midwest and the South have in some sense in this election at least, merged again in its politics. Together they present a stark picture of the current political merging of these regions and they offer food for thought for the importance of formerly sectional and regional politics that harken back to an unreconciled civil war in this middle region of the country. Though the problem of race is national, the problematic history of the civil war is largely told still in sectional terms. Lines on the map are clearly drawn and easily understood as blue Union states that fought the war for freedom and gray Confederate states that fought to preserve slavery. With few battlegrounds, whether Confederate monuments or civil rights sites, residents of these states, whether north or south of the Ohio, generally breathe easy about the complicated legacy of that war, safe in the knowledge that former resident Abraham Lincoln ended slavery and with it the painful struggle for civil rights. This is largely understood today as a Southern history and burden. That is until Ohioans like James Alex Fields Jr. and protests over the overnight removal of a forgotten 90 year old plaque venerating Robert E. Lee from its overgrown spot along a sleepy Southwest Ohio town's roadway alongside those in Baltimore, Louisville, Lexington, and St. Louis. And the protests there have become national news and they've complicated this comforting story. Politics are destiny, high and low, social, racial, economic, cultural, ascetic, identity. Among the bitter fruits of the Civil War and its aftermath in the, these former middle border states was a struggle for ownership of new definitions that masked successive unreconciled conflicts before, during, and after the war. The border that now defined them was completed only after the political culture of sectional moderation was replaced with the angry cultural politics of region. This former middle border that had long assimilated slavery and freedom into a Western regional identity was vanquished by antagonistic cultures of slavery, abolition, and racial subordination under new names, Southern, Northern, and Midwestern. One of the most intriguing Civil War monuments in the country stands in Bates County, Missouri, where in 1863, in response to Quantrill's destructive, as you saw on that t-shirt, destructive uh, raid on Lawrence, Kansas, four entire counties were depopulated by the order of the federal government. The representation of that order, which fell squarely upon civilian shoulders, was the opening painting that I had up painted by George Caleb Bigham, and it is clearly a protest painting of how the Civil War played out and how that particular um, order played out in those four counties. This is a representation of how the war affected homes and hearths and how it preyed upon civilians. And in some sense, it is less overtly political than Bingham's painting, but it is every bit as political but it also gives a unique view of the experience of the war in this region and how in some sense Civil War scholarship is only now catching up. Change starts at the margins, but it's completed in the middle. Thanks so much for your attention. <laughs>